and you know, I forgot to record that whole I was gonna say it was beginning. Uh, oh, there goes my shot at sponsorship, YouTube money, the whole thing. YouTube money could have a drink. All right. At any rate, in this particular case, with the database, uh, we have a visual component, which is our grid view. And then we have our data source, which supplies the data for it. And the nice thing is, is we can change the one without messing with the other. All right. Um, so let's look at what we did. On the first page, we created simply by going over to data and dragging over the grid view. We created a SQL data source to be the data for it. With the SQL data source, that consists of two parts, really. Number one is a connection string that says how to connect to the database in question. And the other is a, a SQL statement, what we're going to use to populate that data source. Later on when we get into uh, inserting, updating, and deleting, there will actually be several SQL statements. But for now, to start out, there's at least one SQL statement. And we didn't manually create the SQL statement, we just went in and selected it this way. The last thing that we need to do is we need to sort of link these two up. And you do that by choosing the data source. That's what ties the visual part to the data part. So the data has the data. The visual part is how it's going to be displayed. And then lastly, um, when you choose a data source for the, the grid view, you, you merge those two together. You, you link them up so that the data that is retrieved into the SQL data source is displayed in the grid view. Now we can go and change the grid view, um, and just for the heck of it, I'm going to play with auto format. That allows me to we'll pick autumn, because it's autumn. And that changes the way it looks. We can also go here and edit columns. So for example, customer ID. Um, we may not show that, you know. Um, that might not be necessary. Remember, that's probably going to be a generated number, so we really don't like need to generate that or see that. So I can delete that column. Now, when I delete the column, notice I'm deleting it out of the view. I'm not deleting it out of the um, data source. The data source is going to need that column especially if we're going to do updates and deletes. So when this is what I'm talking about, being able to work independently, being able to remove it from the view, but it's still in the data if we need it for that reason. And I can go in and I can change. It defaults the header to be the name of the database column, but sometimes that's not always something understandable, right, if, especially if you use abbreviations. So you can go and you can edit the header text like that. Um, you can also do things like enable sorting, enable paging, like if we had thousands of customers, we could show 10 of them at a time and then click for the next 10, next 10, next 10, all right? And then when we run this, this populates based on the data that is in the database table for customer. Now the lab, um, our lab time, again, the focus in the lab is your assignments, right? But, you know, think of the word lab and, and the connotations that that gives you. You know, a lab is a place to experiment, all right? Therefore, I would suggest, 
You know, I know you want to get the labs turned in, and I know you want to complete those, but as an experiment, go in and try making just a simple data, uh, data table and, and see if you can bring it up like in this way. All right? Um, you know, go and try to just recreate this example. Create another page that does the exact same thing and see if you can get it to get the same results. And the nice thing is, is we can change the way it's sorted. All right, and all that's built-in functionality in the um, grid view. Now, one thing I want to look at is I want to look at the web config file. All right, I did something wrong when I created this. All right. How do I know I did something wrong? Because the data source is that. There's a hard-coded path name in there. All right. What is wrong with a hard-coded path name? Exactly. It should be relative. And why should it be relative? Because, yeah, it's based on in the root folder, but why is that better than me putting the exact location? Well, think of when I'm grading your stuff, right? You know, this has users BU105, so Charlie uploads something, and he has user slash Charlie slash desktop slash lab one or whatever. Well, unless my machine happens to have that folder and I place this assignment in my Charlie folder, all right, then it's not going to work. All right? It's better to use a relative path. So when you've created your data uh, string, and I don't remember, we can review the tapes like they say in the NFL. We can go back and review what I did last Tuesday. But when I created it, I did something wrong, and we'll see... Um, you know, in future examples if we can catch that. The bottom line is after you create that source, it should not look like this. What should it look like? It should look like this. I'm going to make that a little bit smaller so I can... You know what, I'm, I'm just going to go home. I'm going to go home and I'm going to read more about words. Oh, words are good. I'll go make the change and then I'll make it bigger. It should look like this. The pipe, which is a vertical line, data directory, and then the file name. I think you need the slash as well. Let's go and run this, and it should still work. or not. Um, notice what it tells me. It 
is telling me that users bu205 desktop call app underscore data. So I forgot the underscore when I named that folder. So it's supposed to have the underscore. There is by default, there is a, uh, a, a folder for each ASP.NET project that is the application data folder. And by default, it's named app, app underscore data. I got that wrong and just put in app data. All right, so if I rename it to app underscore data, it should work. Yeah, I have the project open, so I'm going to have to close this and reopen it. All right, and I'm back in business. The key thing, again, is your <coughs> web config file, your connection string, should look like this, where it says data source. You should not have a physical path, a physical full path, C colon something, something, something. It should be data directory. And then create the data directory called app underscore data and put your database in there. Now, thing is about the connection string is that you should only have one of them per database. All right. Now, it's possible for an application to have two databases. Um, I don't know if I want to say it's rare. It's probably not the um, typical situation, though. The nice thing about this connection string is I could, if I was an organization that already had a, day, uh, uh, um, a site up and running and I wanted to test some changes to it, I wouldn't necessarily want to test those changes on the production database, especially if it involved like destructive activities like being able to delete and insert and change data. So what I might do is I might simply have a folder for the test data and a folder for the live data. And then I'd simply change the connection string and I could just change what database this points to. All right? And I could do that and I could run it in test mode or I could run it in um, real mode. All right? But the idea is, is regardless of the kind of database, a connection string tells it how to connect to that database. This is what you need for an access database. The connection string will look different for a SQL Server database or a MySQL or a, um, a Oracle or anything like that. You can actually even um, switch between database platforms simply by manipulating the, um, the, the, the connection string. In an old project years ago, it was this is even on the original version of ASP, not, not ASP.NET, I had a case where when I was at work, I would be connected to our Oracle test database, but when I was at home working on it, I would be connecting to a local access database. Well, all I had to do was switch the connection string, and it would know which one to go to. All right? And ideally, you should only have it once. Right? You shouldn't have multiple connection strings. So the first time you create the connection string, shouldn't should never create another connection string unless you're dealing with another database. Um, therefore, it's important to get it right and, and verify that you have the data directory um, named in there correctly. Questions about this. Let's look at the code. I love GUIs. GUIs are wonderful. 
they make your life easier, except when they don't. All right. Remember, it's a GUI's job to sort of protect certain pieces of information for you, to make it easy on you by not showing you everything. All right. So, as programmers, there's there's times that when we need to see everything on a nuts and bolts level. So I therefore would ask you, use a GUI if you want to to design these things, but don't shy away from looking at this in the source view. Because everything that you put on the GUI is simply in the source view represented a certain way. And I could just as well change it in the source view as I could change it through the GUI. For example, if I wanted to get rid of zip code, I could simply go and remove that. And zip code is gone. So we have our grid view, many of which we took the default for. Actually, these things all happened when we went into the custom view and, and chose that particular theme. So that's when these things got set. Here's our data source view. And there's the actual SQL statement that we executed which is like the simplest SQL statement you could possibly have. Select star from customer. Um, select is the, the SQL statement that you use to perform a query. All right. Star simply indicates every column. And then from is what table do you want every column from. So our data source says select every column from customer. We haven't specified an order. We haven't limited to only certain customers. This will show us everyone in the database. Um, if you don't put an order by on a select statement, what order does it come into? What order will it be displayed? The order in the database is a correct statement. And I believe with access, that's going to be in the primary key order. All right. However, you can't depend on that. All right. Really, if you don't supply an order by, the database could conceivably give it to you in any order. It's going to give it to you in the order that it feels like, which probably will be primary key order. But if you want it in a specific order, you need to specify the order. All right. We'll build upon this. We, I want to do the first example without worrying too much about SQL. So we did that. Now let's go and rewind and pick up a little bit more about database design. Now, if you remember last time, we created a simple call center database that just had one table. Customer table. And that customer table consists of a customer ID, which is auto number, which means that it increments one for each customer. Then a name, address, city, state, and zip. And I defined all of those as being short text fields. Now, if you remember, when we were talking about what makes databases good, we said there's a couple things that make databases good. and allows us to take data and transform it into information. And what advantage do databases have than just having our data in like a bunch of unlinked spreadsheets? Well, number one, the flexibility. In other words, if we have data defined in certain spreadsheets, it's very hard to get that data organized in another way. Not to say that we can't do it, but it's difficult. With databases where each entity has its own table and those tables are linked to each other, it's easy for us to combine the data in different ways. All right? In ways that we hadn't even thought of before. All right? 
And this is a big deal. This is what gives organizations competitive advantages, right? What is, and again, this, this, keep in mind this is not a political science class, this is an IT class, but what is one of Walmart's big keys to success? And I don't want to hear that they don't pay their employees enough and all that. That's probably true, all right? But not, gonna, not going down that path. From an IT perspective, what's, what's some of Walmart's strengths? Anyone know? Really good at converting data to information. Really good at converting data to information. Specifically in what area? There's one area in speci in, in, uh, specifically that they're really good at doing that. Everyday low prices. Everyday low prices? Okay. Well, how do they get those everyday low prices? They get the prices from other companies and compare them. Well, number one is that they, they have a good uh, data exchange with their suppliers so that they can check things and, 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 and know like what kind of stock their suppliers have and so, and so on and so forth. But really the big advantage, and that, that comes into play here, is their logistics, their, their uh, inventory management. In other words, if you think about a company, too much inventory is bad, right? If you have too much inventory, some of it's going to get lost, some of it's going to get stolen, some of it's going to be damaged. Uh, plus, it costs you so much to store it, all right? Plus, that's money tied up that you could be spending on something else, all right? So having too much of an inventory is a problem. Having too little of an inventory is also a problem, too, because if you sell out of a particular good, someone comes in to, to buy it, then you know, you've just lost the sale. So if I go in to buy a new Xbox and there's no Xbox at that store, that store has lost the sale. So too much inventory, too expensive. Too little inventory, lost revenue. So if you hit that sweet spot of just the right amount of inventory, then you're in the optimal position. Well, because Walmart connects with their suppliers and connects with their warehouses and connects with their stores and all that, they're able to take that information and trans uh, or, I'm sorry, data and transform it into information that helps them manage their inventory and order stuff better and order in a very automated way. All right? So that's really one of their keys in doing that. So it really does provide a... Um, uh, a uh, you know a competitive advantage. You think of like Dell computers. You know, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think like Dell or one of the computer manufacturers. I mean, they like have no inventory. Stuff they get stuff as they need it. You know, from their suppliers. You know, and they keep a very minimal inventory. And you know that's good and that's bad. You know, and that could be bad if their information fails them, but it's good if their information is giving them the proper guidance into decisions that are going to be made. So at any rate, flexibility is one of the key things. And if things are stored in rigid silos, it's very difficult to combine them in other ways. But if things are stored in a set of related entities, then you can connect those entities in a variety of different ways. Um, one... one uh, Oh, I was talking to someone, and they, they lived in uh, Florida or someplace that gets a lot of hurricanes. And they said that almost every store would be out of some of the things that you'd buy when there was going to be a hurricane, like bottled water and stuff like that, except Walmart. Walmart was never out of that. Why? Because they know, <laughs> you know, they know the, 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 the purchasing patterns and all that, all right? Um, does anyone know what data mining is? What is data mining? It's not really. That's when you look at, at information and bring it together to make, you look at data and bring it together and formulate it into information. Like yeah, and, and specifically, specifically data mining is this. What do you think about when you think about mining? Imagine me being a prospector. Looking for that really nice, Stone. Exactly. Gold. I kind of look like a prospector, right? You don't know. You know, when you went out, I went, when I went out to California in, in 1849, right? Uh, I didn't know where the gold was, right? So what do you do? You mine for it. You look for it. The whole thing of data mining is looking for stuff that you might not have otherwise noticed. 
all right? There's certain things that a business does that they need, they, they know what sort of information they need, you know? Walmart needs to know what their inventory levels are and what their expected arrival date of orders are and how many they've sold a particular product. Yeah, they need to know that. That's something that they know they need to know. Data mining goes after the stuff that you might not know, that little hidden gold nugget of data that maybe you wouldn't even think about before. So sophisticated data mining software will go and like look for correlations between things and that you wouldn't necessarily even anticipate. So that's really sort of the idea of data mining. Again, flexibility is what allows you to do that. All right, if things are stored very rigidly, you can only see things in a particular format. Whereas if things are stored in a flexible <coughs> manner, um, it's much easier um, to do that. That's why one of the big, big things um, uh, of the last few years has been the concept of big data. You know, what does big data mean? Big data means if you have enough data, you don't have to be particularly smart, right? You can just churn through it, and the data will tell you the story. All right? Um, a classic example of that is, anyone know who Nate Silver is? All right? Nate Silver predicted 50 out of 50 states in the last presidential election. All right? He got every single one of them right. All right? How did he do that? By analyzing enough data. And it's funny, when the elect, you know, when he was making his predictions, people were saying, oh, he's biased, he's, you know, he's this, he's that. And he's like, I'm none of that. I'm just looking at the data. I mean, it's, a, and again, he aggregated and analyzed all these different polls and, you know, did a one, you know, did a great job and he was accurate. I think the election prior to this, he was like 49 out of 50. So he's like batting. 990 over the last two elections. So look him up, and uh, as as 2016 rolls around, and you might you know you might be able to win some money betting on Nate Silver's pick in the election, if if you are prone to bet on elections. All right. So flexibility is key. Flexibility is what allows us to see data in ways that we didn't even expect, or maybe we didn't anticipate, or however you want to put it. The other thing that comes into play is validity. Validity comes into play a couple different ways. Consistency. Accuracy. Integrity. Now these aren't just random adjectives I threw out. Each one has a specific meaning when we're talking about data and information. Consistency means it doesn't matter how you look at the data. You're not going to get two different results if you look for the same thing two different ways. All right? So if you look up my phone number by a department listing, you won't get a different phone number than if you look up my phone number by a name listing, for example, if you're thinking about like on campus. So it's not like there's two separate documents, all right? One that shows phone number by name, one that shows phone number by department. If you look up my phone number, it's going to be my phone number no matter how you get to it. On every single page where it shows my phone number, it's the same number. Now notice that doesn't mean it's right. It could be every single place has the wrong phone number, all right? So just because it's consistent doesn't mean it's accurate, all right? But we do know if it's not consistent, then it's not accurate, right? If there's two different phone numbers for me, one of them has to be wrong, all right? So that's what consistency means. It means no matter how you get to a certain piece of data, it has the same value. Number two is accuracy. Well, accuracy means that that data is right, all right? And that can come into play in a number of different ways, all right? Consistency helps with that, to be sure, because if you find a problem with data, all you have to do is um, 
correct it in one place. It also involves um, things such as integrity. And with integrity, it means that the data has the appearance of being valid or accurate. What do I mean by that? I mean by that, that if you have a credit card number, it looks like a valid credit card number. All right, what's a credit card number? It's either 15 or 16 digits, all right? What's an email address? It is something at something dot something, all right? What's a birth date? That's going to be a day, right? It's not going to be my birth date is green. All right, it's going to be a day, you know, some day, some year. And there's a special kind of integrity, which means, ref which is called referential integrity. And what referential integrity means is where there's a relationship, is a relationship between two valid entities. All right. So we just have one table right now. All right, a customer table. We could talk about there being a call table. You know, because uh, this is supposed to be a call center where the, the uh, customers call in and talk about, you know, the problems that they're experiencing and then the, the, the call center personnel work to resolve those problems. All right. You wouldn't want to have a call that didn't connect with a customer. All right. Why not? Well, you wouldn't know who to call back. Someone has a problem that their report isn't correct. Oh, yeah? Who? Well, I don't know. Or customer number XYZ. Well, you don't have a customer number XYZ. Oh, well, I guess they'll have to figure it out on their own then. All right? So referential integrity means if two tables point to each other, that that relationship is valid. Again, it could be wrong. Right? <coughs> Jones Incorporated could call in, and I could log the call to Smith Incorporated. But I can't log it to a customer that doesn't exist. Now, how is that accomplished? It's accomplished through the use of what's called a foreign key. All right? All these things work together to create more accurate data, and data that's easier to fix if it is wrong. We're going to focus a lot on referential integrity because that's probably, I won't say it's a tough concept, but it takes a little bit of work. <coughs> this is a snippet from an entity relationship diagram. And an entity relationship diagram shows just that. It shows the entities that's involved in a problem. And it shows the relationship between those entities. All right. In this case, customer and call have a relationship. All right. Now, the little crow's feet or whatever you call them at the end indicates what's called the cardinality of the relationship. All right. There's three kind of relationships, but one of them is most important. All right. A relationship can be a one-to-one -one relationship. A relationship can be a one-to-many relationship. And finally, a relationship can be a many-to-many -many relationship. Which of these do you think is the most important relationship, most common relationship you're going to see? One-to-many. Why is that? One-to-one is actually kind of rare. All right? <clears throat> Not completely rare, but it's kind of rare. Like if we were to think about relationships here on campus between the different entities, it's kind of hard to think of one-to-one -one relationship, right? Um, relationship between student and class. Well, that's a many-to-many, -many, right? And I'll define what this means in a second. Well, let's define what it means now, all right? When I talk about the cardinality, you look in both directions. If I say one to one, that means that one of these is related to one of these, and one of these is related to one of those. So you have to look in both directions. One to many says that one of these is related to many of these, 
but each of these is only related to one of these. And then finally, many to many, one of these is related to many of these, each of these is related to many of these. So you look both ways. So let's think of, let's try to think of a one-to-one -one relationship that exists uh, here on campus. Relationship between student and class. Is that a one-to-one? -one? No. One student can have many classes. Each class can consist of many students. So that's a many-to-many. -many. That's not a one-to-many. What about between professor and class? Well, one professor can teach many classes. Each class, near as I know, only has one professor, though. So that's not a one-to-one. -one. That's a one-to-many. Now, you might say, well, aren't there professors that only teach one class, like an adjunct professor? Yeah, when I say it's a one-to-one, -one, I mean it's limited to that. It doesn't mean that there happens to be some people. In other words, an adjunct could teach more than one class, even though they may not do that on any given um, semester. So that would be a one-to-many between professor and class. Many-to-many -many between student and class. The only one-to-one -one relationship I can think of in a college scenario might be the relationship between dean and division. All right, each division only has one dean. My, you know, the dean of engineering, business, and information technologies is Kelly Zelesnik. That's the only one. There's no tag team deans. All right, there's just one. Now, Kelly, on the other hand, is only the dean of one division. She's not the dean of engineering and math and sciences, or um, health fields, or, or something like that. So that's one example of a one-to-one -one relationship I can think of on campus. All right? And that might even be shaky, right? It might be possible for there to be co-deans. I don't know. I don't, I've never heard of that, so maybe it isn't possible, but um, that's the only example I can think of, of a one-to-one -one relationship. So those are pretty rare. So we can talk about those, but we don't really need to worry about those too much. If you think you have a one-to-one -one relationship, you might want to step back and think about it a little bit more. All right? because it might very well be a one-to-many that's in disguise. Let me give you a great example. You might say the relationship between professor and office is a one-to-one. -one. one professor has an office. Each office is for one professor. And that's probably true in a lot of occasions, but there is cases of professors sharing offices. Our Professor Emeritus's, Emeriti, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Uh, in other words, retired faculty. Retired faculty, if they get approved, have a special status, all right? And it's Emeriti. Um, they all share an office. There's no single office for all the Professor Emeriti. They, they share uh, an office, at least some of them do. So that would be a case of um, it sort of blowing away the one-to-one -one relationship. So we're not going to spend too much time thinking about this. Many-to-many -many relationships do exist, and they're pretty common. But there's a problem with many-to-many -many relationships. What's the problem with a many-to-many -many relationship, database-wise? Linking them to making them unique. What's the problem there? That you can't do it or that? It's, it's easier to do outside. Just trying to link the two many to many directly is difficult. Like if you have one professor and you want to match them to a class, and then it's just difficult. Well, OK. And you're absolutely right. Does anyone want to clarify that? Do you have like repeated data? Pardon me? Do you have repeated data? You, you might have repeated data 
if you have many to many. Bottom line is this. Within a relational database, it's impossible to represent a many-to-many -many relationship directly between two tables. Let me try to explain to you why that is. <clears throat> Let's look at relationship between student and course. And let's say that we have a student table that has a student ID and a name and a bunch of other stuff too. Alright? And let's make up some students. One is Anne Two is Lars. Three is um, it's the toughest part of the job, thinking up names. All right, three students in our school, and Lars and Joan. And there's three courses. They're all CISS. CISS 216, CISS 243, and CISS 265. Mobile application development on the Android platform. A great course. There's my advertisement for today. All right, so in the course table, we're gonna have a course ID and a course name. <clears throat> now, with only these two tables, how do we link these up? Well, Let's go through some possibilities and let's debunk each of those possibilities. Could I put a course ID over here? Oh yeah, I could. Would that help me? Why not? Because it doesn't describe any of the data that's in it. There's no course ID. Not a course. Okay, well, well, well let, me, let me add this to the mix then. Let's say Ann is taking CISS 216 and CISS 265. And Lars is taking CISS 243. And Joan is taking CISS 243 and CISS 265. So, could I put in for Ann the course ID for CISS 265? That will link Ann to CISS 216. For Lars, I could put in the course ID for CISS 243. And for Joan, I could also put in the course ID for CISS 243. And that would link those, those two tables together. But is that correct? What's wrong with it? It doesn't give you all the information. It doesn't give you all the information. In other words, Anne is not just enrolled in CISS 216. Anne is enrolled in CISS 216 and CISS 265. All right? Lars is enrolled just in CISS 243, so it works for Lars. Joan, however, doesn't work for Joan either, because Joan is in, uh, enrolled in CISS 243 and CISS 265. So we can't put one course ID in because a student can have more than one course. Again, one student can have many courses. All right, so having a course ID here doesn't work for that reason. All right, well maybe we can fix that by doing this. Let's put two course IDs here in here.
and Anne is in 1 and 3. Lars is just in 2. I'm going to leave a blank. And Joan is in 2 and 3. Does that fix our problem? Pardon me? No, because, well, one thing, one problem, this isn't the biggest problem, but you're right. Like, there's a blank for Lars Course 2 because he doesn't have any Course 2. And that could potentially um, lead to confusion. All right? There's bigger issues than that. What's the biggest issue with <coughs> that? There's like more than two courses. Yeah, that works for those three students. You know, then again, one course ID worked for Lars. All right, let's imagine that we have someone ambitious. Mark is taking all three of those courses. What do you do with him? Well, it doesn't work. Well, I think we can see that the answer probably isn't adding a third course, right? Because that just delays the problem until Jenny comes along, all right? And is going to take four courses, and so on. So, this gets back to what the student said about repeating fields. Repeating fields are bad. And a repeating field is where you essentially have the same field a few times because that entity matches up with several members of that other entity. All right. Could I, what's the most number of courses a student could take in a semester? Okay, we have a guess at seven. Does anyone want to venture another guess? Yeah, that's true. There's something like one credit hour classes, you know, phys eds and all that. I would not be at all confident in giving a number for that. All right? Because you just never know. And even if there was an answer, I wouldn't be confident that something in the future might change to, to change that. You know, they've talked about taking some courses and breaking them down into two shorter courses. Like, like, a, like a math class. Instead of a math class, have math A and B. So you have, so that way you can focus on one little piece at a time, get that done, and then if you can't make it through math, the second half of it, you just take that part again, right? So there's some good reasons for doing that. So I would hesitate to guess how many would be enough. All right? Okay. Oh, that's okay. Um, is the answer to put in then 100 courses? Because surely, I don't care what changes, there's not going to be, or, or what? What's 7 times 24? 168, all right? Even if you went 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and each hour was its own course, you wouldn't have more than 168 courses. So do I put 168 slots in there? That's a lot of wasted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, you don't. All right. And why? Well, because it's a lot of wasted space, and plus, it makes every future query harder. Because what if I want a list of students that are in CISS 243? <clears throat> there is 168 places you'd have to look for that ID. All right. So. Repeated fields are a no-no. That's the first rule of normalization. Normalization is where our rules or guidelines for um, designing good databases. And as soon as you see a repeating field, that is the same field in a database table more than once because a table is associated with more than one member of a particular entity, that should be a red flag that that's a problem. All right. Now, 
we can rewind and do the exact same thing, go through the exact same thought process about putting student IDs here. Let's put a student ID in the course table. Well, what does that mean? That means only one student can be in that class. Okay, well, let's put 10 then. Well, that means only 10 students can be in that class. All right, let's put 100. Well, you know, some schools, they have lecture halls that are big and a couple hundred students are going to be in a class. All right, well, how many do you put in? So we can follow the exact same logic going in this direction from the course to the student. All right. Exact, every reason that I gave for not putting in course IDs in the student table, the same reason applies for putting student IDs in the course table. Why? Because the relationship is the same going in the other direction. One course can have many students. All right. So, we can't put a course ID in the student table, and we can't put a student ID in the course table. So what do we do? We somehow have to relate these two together. There really is only one other option, right? Put it somewhere else. <laughs> if you can't put it here, you can't put it there, where do we put that relationship? And we create what is called an intersecting entity. Intersecting entities are like this. If you have a many-to-many -many relationship, and how do you know if you have a many-to-many -many relationship? You go in, you got to go in both directions. One of these can have how many of these? One of these can have how many of these? If the answer to both of those questions is many, then it's a many-to-many -many relationship. In fact, counting in databases is easy, all right? Counting, there's only like three numbers in databases, all right? There's zero, like there's no relationship between two entities. There is one, that one of these has one of those. And then there's many. If it's more than one, it is many, all right? So anything past two that you learn how to count was a waste from a database perspective. Because all you have to be able to do is say 0, 1, well, there's a lot of them. All right? That's how you count in database terms. So we've just shown how we can't implement that the way we implement other foreign keys. Right? The way we implement other foreign keys, like for example, between <coughs> professor and course. And the professor, we have a professor ID and a name. So maybe one is Zellers, two is Huffman, three is Harms, and so on. You know, maybe Zellers teaches 216, Harms teaches 243, and um, Zellers teaches that. I can do that, right? Because this is not a many-to-many -many relationship. A professor can teach many courses, but a course only has one professor. All right? So that's how you create a one-to-many relationship, by putting the ID of the one on the many end of the relationship. I can't do that here for all the reasons that I gave. So what do you do? You create an intersecting table. So any one-to-many relationship gets resolved by creating an intersecting table. And that table matches up the two tables. It will at the very least contain the primary key of both the other tables. That's the minimum. Could contain more. For example, could contain your grade, right? Could contain that, you know, you, not only did you take CISS, 
243, but the grade that you got was a, was an A. All right. So what does that table look like in this case? And usually, I didn't coincidentally just say A, B here. Usually, that's how you name it. You give the name of the two tables. The student course table, one way to do it would be to have a student ID and a course ID. So, Ann is in 216. Ann is also in 265. Lars is in 243. Joan is in 243 and 265 and so on. So, there will be one row in this table for each class that a student is enrolled in. So every student will have as many rows in this table as they have courses that are enrolled in. Every course will have in this table one row for every student that's enrolled in this course. So someone's taken 15 courses because they're all one credit hour courses. They're in that table 15 times. All right. And you see that the maximum number isn't a restriction because if they you have someone come around next semester that's enrolled in 16 courses, well, they just have one more row in that table. All right. What's the primary key to that table? I, hear, I see no, someone shaking their head. No Pardon me? There's no primary key. There is no primary key. Ooh, I wish I had a siren. I would, I would blow off the siren for that. Every table needs a primary key. It's a combination of those two things, all right? The student ID plus the course ID in combination. Because that combination has to be unique. Neither part of it has to be unique. In other words, the student can be in there more than once. The course can be in there more than once. But the specific combination of a student and course can't be in there more than once. And again, if you're talking about within a single semester, which sort of is the assumption here, a student can't be taking the same course twice. I mean, I think you all enjoy this course, but I don't think that you would enjoy it enough to enroll in it twice in one semester. Probably not. Yeah. All right. So, therefore, that's a restriction that, yeah, uh, you can only do that. Now, I could generate a key. There's other ways that I could do that, but the most straightforward way is to make the combination of those two things. All right. Um, it, it, it's like, what would the primary key of a license plate be? Would it just be the state? No. There's a lot of Ohio license plates. Would it just be the plate number? ABC123. No. There could be an ABC123 in Ohio and one in Michigan. All right. But the combination of state and license number would be a primary key if we were doing a nationwide license plate application. All right. So, um, in that case, they would both be primary key. And you have sort of the same situation here. The normalization and rules in a nutshell say that I am not going to have repeating fields, first of all. So I'm not going to implement a many-to-many -many relationship by putting in course one, course two, course three. Second part of the normalization rule is that I'm not going to put, I'm going to put data in its, the second and third part really say I'm not going to put data in the wrong place. I'm going to always put data in the right place. So what would be the wrong, what would be wrong with putting the student name here? putting the student name in the student course table. So I put Ann, Ann, Lars, and Joan. <clears throat> What's wrong? 
along with that. I already have it in the other table. All right. If you need it, you can refer back to that table. All right. So we don't really need it there. Specifically, what's the problem if it is there, though? Pardon me? It's redundant. It doesn't add any value. And what if we changed it? What if what if Anne's name was actually Anna and we got it wrong? We'd have to go and find it and change it in a bunch of places. Or we get some sort of inconsistency where we put in Anna's or Anne, whatever she's going by these days. We put in her student ID, but we put Lars's name in. So we have an inconsistency there. In other words, if I were to go to each one of your classes and ask your professor your name, they would give me the same answer. I don't think anyone is taking a specific course under an alias. Like in my class, you're John Smith, but in Huffman's class, you're John Doe, all right, or something like that. It's not the case. In database terms, that doesn't depend on the primary key. Doesn't depend on a combination of student and course. It only depends on the student. So the name depends on the student. All right? Student doesn't have different names in different courses. So therefore, it doesn't belong here. All right? In other words, a field should depend on the entire primary key. Now grade, that could go here, right? Because you don't, well, you guys do. You guys, I'm sure, get all A's in all your classes. But think of, of a typical student. A typical student won't necessarily get the same grade in every class. So in other words, if you ask what a student's grade is, you have to know what grade for what class. So it does depend on both the student and the class. Not everyone in the class gets the same grade. A student doesn't get the same grade in every class. Therefore, it depends on the student and the course, what the grade is. All right? So a field needs to depend on the entire primary key. Lastly, it needs to depend only on the primary key. So for example, if I had a professor ID here, I would not put professor name here. Why not? Well, I can get the professor's name by looking at the professor table. And it's not that I don't need to do that, but it's harmless. It's actually bad. Because my name doesn't depend on what class I'm teaching. All right? You go to my class tonight, I'm still Professor Zellers. Like you go to my class on Monday and Wednesday. It's not like I'm going in under another name in my other classes. That actually would be kind of cool. I ought to do that one semester just as an experiment. But database-wise, that doesn't make any sense. So the data, each attribute has to depend only on the primary key. When I say depend, I mean that that's all you need to know to know that piece of information. So, all you need to know to know a student's name is a student number. All you need to know to know a professor's name is a professor's number, not the course number that, that you're teaching. Now, to know the grade, you do need to know both the student and the course that you're talking about. Because each student gets different grades in different courses. Each course, every student gets their own grade. OK. So next time on Thursday, we will go in and we will actually start adding some relationships and tables. I can't believe it's only 1130. I don't know. You guys are probably thinking, I can't believe it's still Tuesday, right? But I can't believe it's, it's, it's 1130 already. I thought I had another half hour or so to go, and you're probably relieved that I don't. But all right, we'll see you over in lab. So student ID and course ID individually are foreign keys, but together they make up the primary key for that table? Exactly. Okay. So is there like an imaginary one, two, three, four, five, or that primary key for the student? You could.
that would be another way to do it. Right. I mean, it's kind of useless because if the students are one, right, twice, it'd be like one and two or both. Like right. Or something. Right. Um, when you would do that would be if multiples were allowed. Let me try to think of an instance of that. I'm, I'm, I'm pondering another question. Just, just give me a second. Um, posting comments on a Facebook status. All right. Yeah. Facebook status will have an ID. User will have an ID. All right. What would the comment primary character key be? Could it be a combination of the user and the Facebook status ID. Yes, but then each user could only comment once in. And you know that that ain't going to work because you're going to get into some heated arguments where you're going to need to post 15, 20 times, right? So therefore, you could not use a combination of the Facebook status ID and the user ID. Then you could make a generated comment ID that would just be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and those would be then foreign keys but not part of the primary key. In this particular case, if you're looking at one semester, a student can only be enrolled in a class right. once, so that restriction is valid. But in the case of that, that would not be valid. Yeah. It's allowed to 